step after step. I'll take the test. All right, cooling. We're, we start talking about uh, aircraft cooling because that's a big deal. Because without it, everything gets all melty. So an engine, an engine that is overheated, that is overheated has a lot of bad things happen. One, breakdown, breakdown in oil viscosity and destroys lubricating properties. So that's one bad thing. Um, depending on how hot it gets, the fuel air mixture, fuel air mix becomes overheated or becomes preheated I should say preheated and pre-ignition can happen which could cause detonation which causes more heat Uh, well, once parts get hot, it'll weaken, weaken parts. When your crankshaft gets very blue, that is not a good thing. Is there, any, no. yeah, yeah. Is there any risk with um, like a case overheating? Like, how do you know if your case, if you buy a, an old engine or something like that? I know you don't. You, you just, just don't. don't. You just got to be hopeful. Can't tell with aluminum, but I'm aware of metallurgy, metallurgical tests. Uh, weakens part. Uh, the pistons will start to expand faster than the cylinder, so you're going to get scoring. And then after you get that happening and it starts scoring really bad, which I suppose would create more friction, which would create more heat, you're going to get a seizure. And when your engine seizes, that just means that the pistons have grown bigger than the cylinder and they stick. I was uh, listening to one of those podcasts the other day. Uh, I learned about flying from that. It's really good. And... I mentioned before, the guy had a uh, turbocharger failure. So he thought he just had a turbo failure. What well, sounds like either the turbo exploded and all the oil dumped out or the oil line broke, oil dumped out. So uh, a loss of a turbocharger in and of itself is not an emergency. You just got to drop your altitude. You know, your engine's just like, oh, suddenly your engine thought it was at sea level. Now it thinks it's at, you know. 18,000 feet. So your engine loses a lot of performance. You can just drop down to where a normally aspirated engine would fly and continue on. That's kind of what he thought uh, until he looked over at his oil pressure and it had been on zero for a while. So, and then he said the thing started to seize up on it. And this is why I listen to stuff like this as a pilot. Uh, as a mechanic, it's just great to, to know this stuff. But as a pilot, you learn so much. And he talked about the fact that how bad that engine shook. He said he was never prepared for it. He said, I had no idea. I had heard that you would get vibration. I heard that this would happen, but the shaking was unfreaking believable He said, the panic became, this engine's going to leave the airframe. And when an engine leaves an airframe, it throws off the weight and balance, and you no longer, go, you just back up. And you, it's completely under control. But he really thought he was going to lose the engine off the front of the aircraft. It shook so bad because the cylinders are actually seizing up at different rates. And so it's kind of a start-stop kind of a thing. And he said it was bad. <clears throat> so don't let the engine seize is the takeaway from that. If one cylinder seizes, it, you're, you're, I don't know if you're going to have one cylinder. I mean, if it's doing it to one, it's going to do it to the others. It's rare that you're going to have one that's the, a problem, I would think. But I think, yeah, but if, so if you have one seizes and the other three haven't seized, wouldn't that stop all of them? Seizing? Yes. So then it or 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 is in his case what had happened is it broke the connecting rod to that one, and now that connecting rod is going around, and it is out of balance and it starts whacking holes 
into the crankcase. So it busted big holes in the crankcase, which let what little bit of oil was left all over the hot exhaust. So the whole thing is now smoking, and he thinks there's going to be a fire, but luckily it didn't. So. Right. Turning it, turning it off and on again? Yeah. <laughs> 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 plug it, plug it power back cycle. in? Yeah, power cycle, really turn it off. It's like solving five sides of a room too. <clears throat> all right, air-cooled engines. So most all of our engines are air-cooled. Well, in one way or another, they are all air-cooled. One way or another, everything's air-cooled. Your car is air-cooled. It's just water first, and then the water is cooled by the air, and then the cooler water goes back in the engine and brings the heat out from the water, and then it goes through the radiator where air goes across it. So, but our, we just skip the water part in most of our engines, and we just go right to the air cooling. So, um, and that's going to be true for recips and turbines, really. So, but since I'm talking about recips, uh, most recips engines are air cooled. You know, obviously, we go back to, you know, World War II, the, the, V12 with them, I think, and the Merlins, the Allison's uh, water cooled. Um, All the inlines. Yeah, no, 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 they were air cooled. They're, they're air cooled. Uh, inlines are air cooled. Um, Rotax engines are half and half. They depend upon water cooling, uh, but they're partially air cooled. They have air cooled fins, and according to Rotax, if you did lose all of your water cooling, your engine would continue to run, albeit when you landed, it would be non-usable. It's you're just it's eating itself up, but it will get you to where you got to go. How far that is, I don't know. Uh, so uh, most of our engines are air cooled. It's taken for granted. Most mechanics that aren't well trained in piston aircraft engines just kind of look at it and go, "Well, there's fins. The fins are on the cylinders. If the fins are there." Air is going to come across it, it ought to work, and it doesn't work that way at all. So proper cooling, proper cooling is dependent on proper installation. Uh, proper care and maintenance, proper care and maintenance. Of cooling components cannot be overstated. Cannot be overstated. And the reason why is because it is so neglected. It's just one of those things. Well, the airplane's not going to fall out of the sky if these little metal bracket directing air inside the engine breaks, right? And so people just kind of let it go, go, go. Uh, it's not that uncommon to get an aircraft that you haven't looked at before come in the shop. You're looking at it like you're actually missing a lot of pieces off your baffling. Uh, my airplane was missing some pieces off the baffling, and I'm, you know when I got it home, it's the first thing I did. I grounded it until I could go through all of the baffling and all the hoses, and fig and redo everything. Then you'd be redone. It's missing big pieces. It's like because it, it broke in such a way that it was like it looked like it was supposed to have broken there, and it wasn't. So uh, let me see one, two, three. Uh, okay, what are the parts involved? Parts. All right, so typically you're going to have a cylinder temp gauge. Not always. Uh, Cessna 150s, they didn't come with temp gauges. Uh, anything before that, smaller airplanes, your airplane didn't have a temp gauge, Cubs. You don't really get into a temp gauge until you get like a 172 or bigger, and then only then they're going to give you one. So out of four or six cylinders, you get one cylinder has a probe on it. So my 182 six cylinders from the factory had one cylinder had a probe on it. And you can't guess where it goes. You have to put it in accordance with the type certificate data sheet. Actually says cylinder head temp gauge on cylinder number three. You can't put it anywhere else. Got to be there. Cylinder number three. Can that be the hottest one out of the bunch? Uh, presumably, yes. All right, so, uh, so these gauges, um, you have the attachment that goes to the cylinder. You're either going to have the bayonet type or the spark plug washer type. Uh, 
Um, if it's a single unit, so a single unit. will be placed on the hottest cylinder. Hottest cylinder, which is not always the rearmost, right? My number three is the middle, right middle. So because of the way the air and the prop moves and it comes in the cowling, it, it can vary. Usually it's the rearmost, but not always. Um, so cylinder temp, so I'll put that not always the rearmost. Uh, let's see, ideal cylinder temp. What's our ideal hottest cylinder temp? Uh, two, Under, oh well, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, 400 degrees. <laughs> yeah. All right, what do we know about gauges in an airplane? They can be terribly inaccurate. Uh, for example, those are my two probes, the bayonet and the spark plug washer type. If I put a bayonet, uh, the same cylinder, if I put the bayonet and the spark plug washer type on the same cylinder, they're not going to read the same. Spark plug washer is going to read uh, hotter. If I put the spark plug one on top of the cylinder, I think it reads something like 40 degrees cooler than on the bottom. So that's a big difference. So that would mean if I'm using the spark plug type and it went on the top, then my max cylinder head temp should be 360. Up on the bottom, 400. And we like to call them spark plug temperature probes. Anyway. Can, you, can you run multiple and then take an average? Or I mean, how would you do it then? Well, you know. It sounds like something you'd have like a digital system. Uh, okay, so my point being if you had all spark plug washers and you put them all on the top, know that they're going to read cooler than if you put them all on the bottom. So, so if you're right flying around you're like, hey, it's 400 degrees up top, you put on the bottoms before 40. So be careful if you install these and put them on the top. Right. Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is if you're looking for an ideal 400 degree temperature, what is that? The hottest temperature that the cylinder gets? So you, that you should get, yeah. So you would go to the, the point where it's like, and then how do you know if it's accurate, if it's super off? It's like, how do you um, dial them? You trust them to a point. But you just have to know that the spark plug type will read cooler up top. But if it's on the bottom, like mine was factory installed. Oh, I had bayonet factory installed. That's right. Um, if it's a factory installed washer type, then it just tells you what temp it's supposed to be. And that's what you have to go with. They're the ones that set it up. <clears throat> yep. They're the probes. No, you can still get it in brand new stuff. Okay. They'll ask you when you go to put it together, you know, what do you want? You want the bayonet? Because if you lived in a cold environment and you had uh, cylinder preheaters, your, your bayonet type is going to be taken up with a probe that heats up. So you have to go with the spark plug type. So there's reasons why you, you get spark plug type versus. Uh, so yeah, just to show how weird it is. So if my Cessna came with this bayonet type in cylinder number three, and so I have my factory gauge cluster and it's got cylinder head temp and it's got one probe. It's going to cylinder number three and I want to add um, a digital readout that has six cylinders, has it gives me a six cylinder readout. So I'm going to upgrade it to something that's for all six cylinders. Like there's uh, JPI is a very popular company. So you can get like the JPI, I think it's like the 730, which they say it's advisory only, which means it's not certificated as a replacement for your gauges, but it's certificated as an additional advisory piece of equipment. So that would have all six cylinders, but you can't change out this probe right here. So this bayonet probe has to still go to the factory gauge. Then you're left with your new digital readout. It's like, well, what do you want? Do you want to get six spark plug washer types or do you want to get five bayonet types and one spark plug washer, which is usually how they sell it. 
So if you say, I have a factory installed bayonet, they'll say, okay. Then you get five bayonets and one spark plug washer with your new kit. Follow? Because you can't move the stuff. We have a six cylinder engine, right? And so I just bought a new kit that tells me the, the temperature of all six cylinders. So in my engine, if cylinder number three has the factory bayonet, follow? And I buy a new system, then cylinders one, not three, two, four, one, two, not three, four, five, and six are gonna have bayonets for the new system. And that cylinder that was already has the bayonet being used, it gets a spark plug washer type. <laughs> hey, he's gonna explain it. Did you get it? Okay, it's like this. It's like this. They all have the inputs. All right. So here I've got a here I've got an engine, right? We'll go like this way. Uh, one, three, five, two, four, six. Not to scale. So then I've got the factory gauge, factory, factory. I know I was going to be some factory gate, factory cylinder head temp, right? Okay, so that's going to go to number three, bayonet style. I'll put B for bayonet, and I'm and now. I don't want to know, I want to know all my cylinder head temps. So I buy this new gauge and it's very fancy and it has all these little bar greaves. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's all like bar graphs and in color and it looks really cool. Well, it's going to have, going to connect with a bayonet here, a bayonet here, a bayonet here, a bayonet there, this over here, bayonet connector there. And then this one right here is going to go this cylinder and oh, the bayonet's already being used. So what do I have to do? That gets a spark plug style. Follow? Yeah. Okay. Everybody else is good? Oh yeah, very different. Yeah, a little bit. I don't know. I, don't, I didn't do that. So. Oh, okay. You didn't upgrade to that? Okay. Then you can take it a step further. So what was the problem with this unit right here, this new colorful unit? It's not approved as a primary source. It's approved as a secondary, advisory only. But then you can go a step further and you can buy replacement uh, primary. And so if you bought a brand new primary system, which looks the same, tastes the same, and smells the same, it just doesn't cost the same, <laughs> then you throw away all your factory stuff and you put in that. What's the difference? <laughs> it's only money. It's only money. I probably shouldn't have brought that up. But anyway, just so you know. <laughs> uh, let's see, cylinder, ideal head. Okay, don't trust them. Uh, number two, our cowling. Cowling is very, very important. Uh, it's not just there to look pretty. Um, it is considered a pressure cowl. So it's, it is a pressure cowl. So we have high pressure, low velocity, air on top, air on top, air on top usually if it's uh, a radial this doesn't count because they're just a oh, in the front um, it'd be in the front if it's a uh, inverted engine it would be on the bottom so if we're talking we're talking about all of our typical aircraft so high pressure low velocity air on top and that means we have low pressure high velocity air on bottom. So this low pressure, the low pressure 
pulls the high pressure down. And that brings the air across the cylinders. Hmm? Pulls the high pressure down. Yeah, but that's a low pressure, high velocity, low pressure. High oh, pressure, see, see, yeah, sorry, got it? Okay, good. Okay. So, thinking of like a warbird, how it has some of them have a big scoop on the belly of the plane, is that to? Yeah, you scoop usually goes to the oil cooler or radiator. That's, that's for like a P-51, I think that's where the radiator is. Mm -hmm. I gotta look at him, he's like the historian over here. So this is your typical arrangement, all right, like that. And so because it's what we're looking for here is we need to have seals everywhere. So there's got to be a seal, and this seal, a rubber seal bends forward. And there's also a plate that comes across here. And if I turn that sideways and look at it, that plate, it also has a seal that goes up, a rubber seal. So all the rubber seals go up towards the air. So when the air comes in, it presses up on the seal and locks it in place. And, and if you did it this way, then it would just be like a one-way flap valve and the air would just go like that. So that would not be good. So air goes forward. So you have to make sure that that is correct every time you install cowling, make sure it's all set. But what happens is that, so there's the metal baffle and the rubber seal. Sometimes we'll just call the rubber baffling too. So it's all baffling. Uh, but we to be specific, I didn't mean it that way, but huh, I get it now. To be specific, you have the aluminum baffle and the rubber baffle seal. Uh, the aluminum baffle is under a lot of vibration. It cracks. It's very expensive like everything else. You have to keep up on it. You look for cracks. You fix your cracks. It's where your sheet metal skills come into place. This rubber seal, you want to change it out when it gets old and it's not flexible. But, man, I have seen planes where it just comes in oh, and it looks like that. <laughs> this is out of Lyco or Continental's uh, book. This picture just makes me nuts for a couple of reasons. What is this crap down here on yeah, the cylinder? Pressure, gate, uh, compression. Compression. Yeah, that's your compression reading. And I'm like, this is, this is Ferrari money nowadays. You know, if you were a Ferrari mechanic and some guy brought in his freaking really nice Ferrari, you know, and you see the engine through the back glass and stuff. Uh, would you write the compression readings or notes of gaskets and stuff on the heads? So this is a, you know, nowadays this is an $80,000 engine, you know, connected to a $250,000 aircraft. Uh, don't do that. Uh, if you want to, do it. Uh, but don't tell them I said so. But this, this is not sealing anything. I mean, this stuff, it's all old and brittle and nasty. So... It's time, and I. Like fabric and rubber right now. It is a yeah. It's a fabric -y, It's rubber with like fabric in the middle. I hate replacing it. I really do. To me, this is arts and crafts. I hate arts and crafts. I hate anything arts and crafts at all. Um, don't like it because you have to like cut it and form it and. <laughs> so when it came time to do the baffle on my airplane, my daughter did it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly take too long. I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know, she's like, just give me the damn scissors, Dad. She just plops on the ground. And this is back when she was like really sick. She's got a backpack with a feeding tube on it. I'm embarrassed, man, but she's down there just, you know, cutting it all up. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> you just rivet it on. Here's your piece. Rivet it. All right, I'll do it, baby. So, yeah, that is not that is not cool. That is not good at all. This engine is uh, probably overheating. And, and uh, the other thing is these big leaks back here. So the first thing I did to mine is I bought brand new rubber baffle seal and a tube of black RTV and sealed up every little light leak, that right there, everything. Take the time to do it. My airplane now is really cool. I never have a problem with overheating. Yeah, because I took the time to do it. Uh, this stuff's so wore out that it probably doesn't even reach the cowling. Huh? Well, they start drilling holes and stuff. I hate it when I do that. Um, okay, what this is, is you're supposed to inspect your cowling and you can see where the rubber has been rubbing. 
and where it's not. And so you can see how the air just flows through here. It's all air leaks. And you don't want that. Also, a takeaway from that is it rubs against your cowling. You might want to put some anti-chafe tape across that if it's rubbing that, that severely. This is just a beautiful picture. I see that, I'm like, damn. Yeah, isn't that? It's gorgeous. I mean, look back here. They got all the baffle lays perfect down around the accessory section. And I mean, it is just, wow. <laughs> no, it's something I stole from the internet. So whoever did it, uh, because the engine's black, it probably was done uh, by Victor Aviation in Palo Alto. So they, they have their black edition. All right, that's for another thing. All right, so that was all my pictures. So let's see. Uh, cooling, assuming pressure cow. Oh, it wasn't all the pictures. All right, then we have a thing we need to be aware of is cow flaps. Your cowling is actually designed to help in this low pressure area. <coughs> so we get into older airplanes or small airplanes, uh, like this one up here. It just has a piece of metal that's riveted. That one looks a little too flat. That's not appropriate. Yeah, that's like a speed brake there. But the cowling comes and it just makes a little uh, let's see. low pressure pocket. Low pressure pocket. Let's see, pen, yep. So you have your cowling and the opening in the back, they just put a little lip right there and that creates a low pressure behind it. So this is all low pressure here, which draws the air out. There's your low pressure because you got to have an outlet for the air, all right? But more fancy airplanes will have cow flaps that are controlled by the pilot. So these right here are deployed. This one's deployed. These here, the white one, they go down, back up. Uh, like uh, the 150s, 170s, they don't have controllable flaps. So 180s and up do. Um, and these would have control flaps. So when you are on the ground, operating on the ground, you don't have a lot of cooling coming in, you want your cow flaps open. Open up that area, let more air flow through on takeoff. And then once you get up to altitude and you're flying, you can close your cow flaps up, less drag. The airplane goes a little faster. Not much, but a little tiny bit and you close them so that the exhaust doesn't get on them. Yeah. So those are cow flaps. Uh, they're different type of cow flaps. They, there's all different kinds. So some of them are just cable operated. Some have an electric motor. Um, so let me write this. Controls cow flaps. Controls the amount of air flowing. Um, around the cylinders, around the cylinders. Just more specifically, the amount of air that's allowed to actually enter the whole cowling to begin with. You block off the outlet, not much comes in the inlet. Is that uh, something you're able to, you're allowed to modify to a certain extent? So nope. Like if you are, um, <laughs> you don't modify anything on these engines. Well, like if, in terms of adjusting the angle of the cowling. Oh, like, okay, so his, his airplane, the Luscom, mm -hmm. that has fixed ones, mm -hmm. We tape up the inlet holes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they could. They could flatten that out and they wouldn't get quite so much. Okay. My airplane has a winterization kit. The holes on each side of my cowling are about that big, and there's a kit that came with it that gets it down to about that big. So you can modify the air in, but as far as the cow flaps, you know, it's just to modify them. In fact, you're supposed to check the actual travel of them all the time, make sure it's exactly what it's supposed to be. So we have manual type. And you manual, which like my airplane, is have a lever. Just reach over, and open, closed. No yeah, all, all every place in between. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's so all the way. Up, I can go open a little bit. So I'll be flying along, and I usually reach over and close the most of the way. And then at once I'm at altitude, and the, then I'll watch if the cylinders and the oil temp start creeping up more than I want it. Then I'll open a little bit more. If I close them a little bit and I look over and they're still like running great and the temperature's nice, I'll close it the rest of the way. We have electric. Just instead of a handle in the cockpit, you just have a button, open, close. There's something else. Oh yeah, there's automatic ones too.
thermostatically controlled. T h e r m o s t a t i c a l. Thermostatically controlled. Dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to make sure you check the rigging on them. That's often ignored. They're supposed to open a certain amount and close all the way. If they don't, well, you got to re-rig them. Um, I did mention they are open during ground operation. I would. I, I do, even during warm-up. I don't. I open mine up. Yeah. I suppose in really cold environments, pilots may want to close them, but uh, I open them. But I'm not in a really cold environment. Could they set it, I don't know, if it would be common, the weight on gear switch? So as long as there's weight on gear, it forces them open? I don't know. I think he's a pilot. You like to have control of things. I know. Open during ground operation, asterisk. Not if you forget. <laughs> Uh, usually partially, uh, what was I going to say, uh, partially closed or closed um, at cruise, assuming you have enough cooling. All right, uh, cooling fins, I think we already talked enough about this. Um, obviously, you're going to inspect for bent or cracked fins. Inspect for bent or cracked fins. Fins. There we go. Fins. Um, so for Continental, we have SB96-12. Talks all about the allowable for bent or cracked fins and light combing is oh, light combing is the overhaul manual chapter six yeah chapter six which you guys already read all right that brings me right circle back right around to my pressure baffles which i showed you all the pictures So pressure baffles would be our aluminum structure around the engine. I don't know if structure is the right word. It's not structural at all. Engine designed to force air around the cylinders. So these baffles, there's all different kinds, but there's all these little pieces of parts. Light combing's nice. You guys put yours on there. It's just one plate that goes in the middle, one plate goes on the top. You're done. Um, the smaller Continentals have multiple pieces. Mine has multiple pieces. You got to make sure this stuff goes in there all the time, the right space. It's sometimes very, very difficult to get it to fit very well, but you got to make sure it's there. So there's, it's, we call it inner cylinder baffles. So you have the structure around the engine, and then in between the cylinders, you have inner cylinder baffles. Because if you take a look at your light combing that you built, the cylinders are, you know, what, that far apart or so? I mean, they don't. Now the heads are really close, but the barrels are not. And you just can't have air just kind of wandering around through there. You need to force it to go through and right in contact with the barrel. So it's really important that this stuff is in there. If you're missing any piece, you can really damage a cylinder. Let me see. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna write that. I already said repair cracks, stop drill patch as they appear to prevent loss of cooling, seal small holes with RTV. So repair as needed. Use, what's RTV? Room temperature vulcanizing. It's silicone, sealants. Use RTV to seal holes. Uh, 
Uh, then we have our flexible baffle seal. So as I mentioned, you have to form it in the proper direction. Must be formed in proper direction. If you <coughs> which is which way? The into wind. the wind. Forward, yep, into the wind. Uh, that's better what you said. Into airstream. If you um, have a damaged baffle, can you make one? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be like a certified part that's approved. To repair. So I can just grab some wind. First of all, you own the airplane, right? Yeah. Owner produce parts. You can make anything you want. What? Yeah, there's a weird thing about that. Wait, I gotta know about this. It's, there's an advisory <laughs> circular in there, and it makes no sense to me why, but if you own your own aircraft and you're flying in part 91, it's not for hire or anything like that, you can make your own part and install it. Oh, Game cylinder. <laughs> yep. And now the question, and so the, the theory is kind of there. It's like, well, and you have to document, and you have to follow this it's, it's circular. It's a little complicated, but, you know, for people who are into machining and making stuff it's your own airplane you can do it for your own airplane but the weird part is well, what happens when you sell it i guess it's okay there's nothing that says you can't sell it then so it's kind of a funny thing but yeah you can definitely make your own who the hell made this part i did yep <laughs> uh what else i gonna say oh yeah look for rubbing on cowling look for continuous rubbing on cowling. What's the rubbing there for? What's it telling me? It's chafing. Chafing, but it's... Yeah, it's, chafing. it's good when it chafes. Just put some chafe tape on there, maybe. Uh, and obviously replace when worn. Replace when worn. Oops, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> I was trying to write two words at once. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Um, or, or hard slash brittle. Brittle. Is it clear or EO? Huh? Um, all right, I already talked about the inner cylinder baffles. So. Inner cylinder baffles, and I said that directs the cooling air in close proximity to the cylinders. Directs cooling air in close contact with the cooling fins. All right, that was kind of quick. There's a thing called an augmenter. I was looking at that on the Q&A, so I was like, I don't remember who's talking about this. All right. So an augmenter is found in uh, twins or something. And what it is, these exhaust stacks stop short and blow air down this tube, which creates a low pressure right here. So kind of the way to describe this is, um, when my son was really a little guy, we had a, like a big blow up pool and the air compressor with the some air nozzle you guys use, you know, to squeeze it. And I said, hey, let's have a race to see who can blow up, because they had two chambers that were the same size. Who can blow up their chamber the fastest? You go first. So. He takes his air nozzle and he gets a really good tight seal around it and puts the air nozzle so no air leaks at all, right? And he blows it up and I, my stopwatch, I'm like, okay, and he, you know, he finished. And then I took the air nozzle and here's, you know, the hole is right there. I just took the air nozzle about the A-fire part and aimed it at it and squeezed it. And I blew mine out four times faster than he did. 
Because Why is that? Because this air jet going in created high velocity, which is low pressure. There's a low pressure area here, so all the air around, 360 degrees, added to it. So an augmenter is doing the same thing. In fact, I'm going to see him tonight. He still owes me 100 bucks for that. Did you crush it? You were like, how old was he? Like five or something. <laughs> I was one of those terrible dads. I never let him win at anything, too. That's good. You got to show him that life's not fair. Then he turned 10, and I never won again. <laughs> yeah, and arm wrestling became harder and harder. And you're like, oh, I've got to quit now. So that's an augmenter, too. So augmenter, where was I? Somewhere in here. I don't know what happened to my... Oh, there it is. Augmenter uses exhaust gas to add airflow so the engine is not completely dependent on ram air. So uses exhaust gas to add airflow so that engine is not completely, it's not completely dependent on ram air. What's ram air? Rolling forward in the sky. Air. air from the airflow. Being for, you, your forward velocity creates ram air. Uh, this creates a low pressure. It creates a low pressure. Area at, let me see, the rear of the engine. Why is it used more on twins than singles? Because you have to have that tube. And so the engine is usually forward of the wing. And so you have this long area that the exhaust has to go to get away from the wing anyway. So you, by nature, can build this tube going away down the wing. So in a single engine that's right in front of you, it's like, there's, where are you going to put the tube? You'd have to put it all half down the belly, and that's just weight, and you wouldn't do it. So since you're already having to build a duct to get the exhaust away from the wing, just use it. And with those, you have to check them at every inspection for corrosion, correct, because of that? Oh, exhaust is a big, big deal. You have to check exhaust every inspection you can. Well, especially with these. Uh, yeah, especially. Well, exhaust, everything exhaust is especially. Yeah, there is no getting around that one. Um, <coughs> All right, this is redundant. I, oh, no, it's not. Blast tubes. You know, I need to know what blast tubes are. I know they sound like fun, but they're not. Blast tubes. Blast tubes basically is where you just take air. Let's see what I can do here. This will work. A blast tube is where they'll drill a hole right here and take a tube. And like just there. So I want both of you, both of them, stay. So it's just a hole drilled in the pressure baffle right here. And so air will then come through here and it'd be blasted down on whatever component you're trying to cool. Because there's not a lot of cooling behind this wall right here, unless you direct it, specifically direct it. Otherwise, it's just a hole there and then it voids the whole thing and doesn't work. So you have blast tubes, maybe. Um, blowing on the magnetos, um, generator, alternator, something like that. So those are blast tubes. So blast tubes um, used to direct air, used to direct cooling air onto a component. Used on air-cooled engines to direct a stream of cooling air to some engine accessories, such as magneto or generator. Um, let me see. I probably don't need to write much of this. Operation of air cooling. Pretty much covered this already. So the cooling operation is dependent upon the high pressure. Without all components in place, the system does not work. 
So everything's got to be in place. It's sad to see somebody who has done work on an aircraft and they take it out and they run it without the cowling because, you know, you've got your cylinders here. There we go. I've got cylinders. There's your rocker box cover. See, cylinders. And so they take it out and they don't have the cowling on and they're like, well, airflow is airflow. Well, what happens is the air comes like this and pretty much like that. And that's your airflow. How much is that cooling? Not really right here, it's cooling right there. That's what it's cooling. Other than that, it's not doing a damn bit of good. So take cylinder head temp right there. Yeah, so make sure you put your probe up front. It doesn't work that way. So um, all components have to be placed. Um, running an engine like that would be similar to draining your radiator in your car and then running it. Which it works for a little while. Uh, let's see. When you test run your engine, oh, this is a fun one. Let's see, when you test run your engine, oh, I shouldn't have done that. It's gonna work. Yay. You're going to put a scoop on it. So it's a contraption that is going to bolt onto the cylinders that's a back to it and a top like that. Now, what's funny to me, and I'm going to tell you and see who does it, is you'd be surprised. Half of the groups will put it on upside down, or I mean backwards. And they will put it so that the opening, if you put it on backwards, you get a small opening in the front and a very large opening in the back. So you want the air to actually come in the scoop from the propeller and go down the cylinders. So got the back is in the back so please don't put it on backwards and tell me I'm ready to run it and so you've got this gigantic opening in the back and a very small opening up front well I want to see my engine run yes <laughs> so yeah so the test cell is going to use the scoop or the hood um, helicopters how do we how do helicopters get cooled Fan, big fan, big fan. Big old, fan. No, not a big fan that sits on the top. Fan on the end. Well, are you talking, we're talking about recips? Yeah. Like yeah. The Volkswagen. So yeah. It's got Volkswagen technology right there. Yeah. Hit, Hitler designed it. Yeah. And so, <laughs> oh, so you this like has a. Reciprocating engine helicopters? I must assume you're a fan of the Nazis as well. <laughs> What? I don't know what he said. He's been waiting to say that all day. My daughter, my daughter actually got really mad at me today. The car on the way into its goal. We were talking about. She's talking about some. Modern, she goes, "Oh yeah, I went to the art gallery because I had some extra time." She told me about a really stupid piece of art. I go, "Yeah, I'm with Hitler on that one. I hate modern art. <laughs> some art's stupid." She goes, "You can't say that." I'm like, "But he said that. That's just, he's known for it." It's like you still can't say that, Dad. Uh, okay, so anyway, so it uses a big fan that is not something you can turn on or off. I mean, you turn off the engine, it'll turn off the fan, but it takes a, uh, scoops up air and blows it across here because uh, these things run hot. They run at higher power settings all the time. Is, is engine driven, you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, belt driven off the engine. Cut your belt, then turn it off. Well, I'll tell you what I think about helicopters. They're awesome. <laughs> A million parts rotating rapidly around an oil leak waiting for metal fatigue to set in. <laughs> Pretty much spot on, yeah. I heard it's just 